I am who God meant me to be. He made no accident with you. And uh, sometimes some of us believe that, like, well, he's kind of screwed some things up with me. Like, he hasn't really given me gifts. He hasn't really empowered me. I don't have a lot to offer. And the reality is you're wrong, (laughs) all right? Because when we read about what Christ has done for us and what God has done for us, here's the first thing we understand, is that you were worth Jesus to God. That, That God sent Jesus to die on a cross for you individually, for you personally, because he wanted to have a relationship with you. That's how much you were worth to God. Isn't that awesome? I mean, every time I, I, and I say that a lot around here because I think we need reminded. We get through like into our busyness of life and, and, uh, and we can get a little crazy and a little tired and we forget that, you know? And so I want us reminded of that as we're talking about gifted is that you are gifted, that, that we have received, if you have accepted Jesus as your savior, the one who paid the price to pay for your sin into your life, you've been given the Holy Spirit and that Holy Spirit has gifted you. He's put something in you to use to be a part of the body of Christ and all of it is needed all of us are needed we all have our part to play and that's what we're learning your purpose in God's power and presence it's not your purpose in your power and your presence that's how so often we try to live life right it's my purpose my power my presence and we exhaust ourselves like we can't do it we can do it for so long and then we poop out you know it's like ah oh, it's too much can't do it when we start to live in our purpose with God's power and God's presence we get to live into something greater, and we get to be part of something actually more fun to be part of. That is the picture of the body of Christ. And so if you're new with us and you're kind of joining in the journey this morning, I'm going to just remind us of what we're talking about with spiritual gifts, okay? Because spiritual gifts, this is our definition, and I keep uh, talking about this every single Sunday. Does anybody have this memorized? No, because it's pretty long, right? Like, you, you know the gist and you know what's going on, but here's our definition of spiritual gifts. A spiritual gift is a supernatural attribute given by the Holy Spirit to every member of the body of Christ. Why? To serve and to reveal God's presence to others. That's what it is. It's a supernatural attribute, meaning it's not just a natural gifting that you have. Like, this is God at work inside of you doing something spiritual in relationship with somebody else. It's all about community and relationship and being a part of the church. It's supernatural, given to us by who? The Holy Spirit. He's the giver. He's the one that decides what gifts we get. And, and how we're supposed to use those in the body. This isn't the spiritual gift buffet, where it's like, I like that one and that one and that one and that one. Um, now, we're going to get to some power gifts in, in a few weeks, and, uh, and we're going to talk about Paul, who said, why don't you pray for actually receiving some gifts? So that's a whole other conversation. Um, but what we need to understand is still it's the Holy Spirit that gives them. It's not a buffet for us to grab from. It's still his choice. So the Holy Spirit can give those to all of us. Why? So we can serve one another, and we can experience the presence of God with each other. And that's what happens when we use these spiritual gifts. Um, We read this in Romans uh, chapter 12. It, It gives us this picture of spiritual gifts. It says, For just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function. It's like, you get the picture? Like, my hand, this hand doesn't do the same thing as that one, and this leg can't do what my head does. Like, I have got a bunch of different parts, they all don't do the same thing, but I need all of them, right? Like we, and he says they all have the same function. So in Christ, we, though many, the church, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. That's what the church is supposed to be. We belong to each other. Like there's this image of the church that today, in today's day and age, we live in the, I would say, in one of the most lonely periods of history in the United States. We isolate ourselves, and then we have, um, we have pretend community, through social media, and we know what's going on, but we don't know the depths of somebody else. And, uh, and we need to push against that because we, as a church, are supposed to be the body in community with one another, right? We belong to one another. We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. Oh, that was the end of the verse. All right, sorry, I thought there was more. There is more to that. You can keep reading if you want to, Romans 12. But that, that picture, we all belong to the body. We all have different parts to play. We all are different parts of this body, and all of the gifts are needed. They're important, and uh, and we need to learn how to step into all of these gifts. Now, I've given some warnings. Have you guys remembered some of the warnings I've given as we have this conversation in community? Yeah, okay. I can hear some of your heads nodding. (laughs) That's, that's, is that a mean joke? I don't know if that's mean, but, um, but, but like what I've, some warnings that I've said, number one is if the, if there's something that you get frustrated with inside of a church, it might be a sign that that's where your gifted is because you're seeing something that others don't. 
And it may be your calling to help fix that problem, whatever that might be. So your frustrations might be the sign of your giftedness. And I gave that warning. It's like, so, so be careful as you're testing your hearts. Number two warning was, don't let those frustrations become a holy huddle of disgruntledness that pushes against everybody else, because I've seen that in church, where they become a holy huddle, and here's my gift, and here's our gifts, and, and we believe our gifts are better than theirs, and it becomes a comparison and a disunity, which is never the work of the Holy Spirit. God is always about bringing what? Unity. That that's, was Jesus' prayer for the church, that they would be one as Christ and God the Father were one. That's his image. So if we're splitting ourselves up and separating, we're not walking in the Spirit. So warning number two with the frustration is use it to not bring disunity, but unity in the body of Christ. And how can you use that gift to bring unity and to fill a need? That was warning number two. Uh, last week, I also gave another picture because with each of these spiritual gifts, you know, we talked about um, the love gifts before, right? Helps, administration, um, what, see, I, I, mercy, thank you very much, and giving. We talked about those love gifts, that those express the love of God in a community. Um, we talked about some of the word gifts already, and we're talking about a few more of the word gifts. We talked, see, I get them all jumbled because there's, there's 21 of them we're talking about, and like I'm doing all of them as I'm sermon prepping. So I'm like, which ones are we talking about today? Um, so, and, and so each of these gifts, as we're learning about them, all of us may have a different capacity in that giftedness. Last week, I asked everybody to close their eyes and imagine a river, and, and, and picture a river in your mind, and then I said, what's on either side of that river? It's river banks, right? That's what contains and holds that water and keeps it flowing in certain directions. It's the same way with our giftedness. If, we have, if you have a specific gift, it may be that the Holy Spirit says, I gave you that gift, now I want you to use it, and here's your capacity. Here, here's where I want you to use it. And for some of us, that might be like a small stream, that our effectiveness might be one-on-one -on -one or with just individuals. And do you know what? Awesome. Use it in that capacity. For some people, it might be like a raging river where it's like they're affecting a lot of people, and all those people are growing in discipleship, and that's the flow, or that's the capacity that the Holy Spirit's chosen for them to use their giftedness. We can't compare the width or the breadth of each other's rivers. We need to let God use us wh wherever he puts us with whoever he puts us with and trust that it's the Holy Spirit at work keeping us in our own lane, right? Keeping us in our own, in our own path, or I'm mixing up metaphors, down our own river, all right? So we're, I have our own paddles, and we're going down the river. So, so I want us to be careful that we don't use giftedness as any comparison. We have to be faithful to what God has given us to be part of this, as the members of this body together. And so we're commissioning you, we're commissioning the church to step into this giftedness. Now, these gifts, we, we have talked about that they're, we're going over about 21 of the spiritual gifts that we see listed in Romans 12, 1 Corinthians 12, Ephesians 4. And we have separated them into three categories, and we're not... We're not first ones to do this. Actually, this is back in the day. A guy by the name of Bobby Clinton wrote a book about this, and he, this is how he split them up. Love gifts, word gifts, and power gifts, okay? We're just using that. That's, that's not how they're split up in Bible, but that's what we're using just to help us categorize how these kind of function in the, in the body. And so we're talking to today, continuing on the word gifts, which these spiritual gifts clarify the nature, action, understand God better, they understand the nature of him, what God is doing, and they understand the purposes of God in their life. And, uh, and, and so today, we're going to continue this conversation, and we're talking about three of them. And I've got sermon notes for you. You guys have your sermon notes out and ready? Yep, yep. all right. Um, you can fill in the blanks on your sermon notes. And these ones are paragraphs, because, we, because I'm giving you a description. If you have this gift, this is what you might experience. And so as you're reading it, some of you in this room may have be like, oh, that's me. And this is the only series I've given permission to use your elbows, all right, right? You can elbow people next to you because it's good stuff. Whenever I preach on stuff that's like convicting, there's no elbows, all right? You got to focus on what God's doing in you. But this one in community, we want to affirm the things we see in each other. If we see these gifts in somebody, be you and, and let them continue to work on that in community with one another and grow in it, okay? So is everybody ready for the first gift? All right, okay. Gift number one we're talking about today is the gift of leadership. The gift of leadership. And this is the spiritual gift of leadership. This is a little different than just leadership in general, okay? This is what it says in Romans 12, 8. If your gift is to lead, then do it 
diligently. Do it diligently. This is one of the ones that he gives a description of how you should do it. Like all the other ones, if it's to serve, then serve is what he says, right? But this one's like, if it's to lead, we'll do it and do it diligently. Do it moving forward. The, the Greek here, the original word for lead in, in the Greek, which we all get excited. Everybody excited? Thank you, Adam. All right, so um, this is what it means. This is, this is kind of how to define this word in the original language here. It's, it's to have charge or rule, manage, protect, or give aid. That's what this word lead means. And it, it, so if that's what we're called to do, he says not only do that, but do it diligently, okay? This image of lead, we see this, this same word throughout the New Testament, and a lot of where we see this word is in um, Timothy and Titus, where Paul is talking to the church, and he's talking to the leaders, and he's describing what it looks like for godly leaders to be elders or shepherds in the church. And he uses this same word. If it is to lead, if it's to shepherd, if it's to be over a group of people, it's always connected to having godly character, your character has to match up with the giftedness, and I've talked about that a lot, right? Because if our character doesn't match up to our giftedness, we will be out of balance, and we'll probably use our giftedness for selfish motivation, right? To feed ourselves or make ourselves feel good. Or, and, and if we're doing that, we will be using it in a dysfunctional way, and we probably will hurt some people around us, especially if you're in charge of people. If you're in charge of people and you're using it for self, selfish motives, ooh, watch out. We talked about teaching last week. Those who have the gift of teaching were warned you're going to be judged more harshly. And that's what happens. When you're a leader, you're not just affecting your own self. You're affecting the people who are underneath you. And so there's a high call of character and integrity that has to be in place for this gift to be used. And so we see that through the New Testament, this gift attached to you better have godly character and integrity to use it because you will be affecting all those who are underneath you. Now, the reality is every single one of us in this room is called the lead. Did you know that? You're leading somebody or something, whether it's in your own home, whether it's in a relationship with a spouse, whether you have kids, you're leading them, whether they're in your house or out of your house, you still continue to be a leading force in their life. We're all leading something. Some of you might lead at work. You may have some people underneath you in employment, and you're a manager, or you, you are, are a team leader, and you lead some other people. Like, all of us have different roles in leadership. This one, when we're talking about the spiritual gift, is different than that, because that is a generic sense of leadership. Is that generic sense is like, I have influence over somebody. This one is spiritual influence. It's greater than just general leadership. And so he says with a spiritual leadership, you have to do it with diligence. That means like with haste, with an earnest in accomplishing it and striving after. I mean, it's like perseverance is what he's saying. If you're going to lead, then lead. Do it. Do it diligently. Keep pressing on. Do you know why he says that? Because leadership is hard. I love a phrase um, that I heard from a, a very strong leader. He said, you know what? Leadership ain't for sissies. <laughs> I love that phrase. It means you have to be persistent. You have to be diligent. You have to keep pressing on and forward. Even when those that are following you can't see the destination that you're taking them towards, you have to lead and do it diligently. This is the person who does it out front of the group. Spiritually speaking, they're the ones that are being the example, and they're following God's will and calling, and they're taking people along for the journey as they take them to where God would call them to be. Some examples, okay? Some examples in Scripture we see who have the gift of leadership. Anybody heard of Moses? I, I talk about him a lot, don't I? Big Mo. Big Mo. Yeah, you guys. Moses w had this. He was out front. God set him in authority over, and he was leading the people. And he was listening to God, and he knew where the next thing is to take them. And he would lead them out in front. And uh, if you think about some other people in the... Um, in the Old Testament, Nehemiah, we did a whole series on, on the book of Nehemiah. Nehemiah was, had the gift of leadership. He saw that the walls in Jerusalem were torn down. He's like, I got to do something. And he shows up. And what does he do? He leads. He like, just, this is what we're doing. Follow me, because I'm following what God said to do. And here we go. And he just leads them, and they follow him. And God shows up, right? And the people rally behind. And then the walls are built, and they come back to God's word. When people lead in a godly way, awesome godly things happen. With integrity and character. I think of the New Testament, people, people like Peter. 
Peter was the first one to preach the gospel message after Jesus has risen from the dead, and boom, the church starts, and thousands were added to their number, and now he is all of a sudden the leader of the first church. He was the first amongst equals of all the apostles who were leading, and they were looking up to him as kind of the key leader with them, and he had this gift of leadership, and, and people followed him, and the church followed as Peter led in the in, in the role leaders, and you think about then the whole rest of the New Testament, the letters that we read from the Apostle Paul. Paul had this gift of leadership. Actually, it's funny when you read about Paul and you read his letters, because um, you think about Jesus, right? And, and I'm going to make a comparison, and some of you are going to call out blasphemy, maybe. I don't know. But, but Jesus did not exercise this, the strong gift of leadership. That wasn't his main gifting when he came and he walked along and did what he did, and do, did miracles, and he taught, and all those kind of things. And, I, and I'm going to help you understand why in just a minute as I describe the difference between leadership and pastor shepherd, the two differences of the gifting. Paul, when you read his letters, are pretty direct. They're pretty aggressive. They're pretty, this is what you got to do, and you got to fix this, and here's what's wrong. Like, that's how he wrote. He, he didn't write, oh, I love you, I'm cuddling you, and oh, it's okay. Paul was more like, this is what you got to get right. I love you, but this is what you got to get right, right? That's what Paul did. He had the gift of leadership, this gift, some examples. So if this is you, this, is, this might describe you. You can fill in these blanks. If you have the spiritual gift of leadership, you have the spiritual ability to, to discern a vision or hear and discern a vision from God for a group. You are able to influence people to follow the direction coming from God, and you lead them into God's will as a group. Does that make sense? If you have the spiritual gift of leadership, this isn't just about doing good stuff and, and having people under you. This is about you being able to capture and hear and discern a vision from God. And then having a group of people saying, this is where God's taken us. And then you lead them there. Um, here's, here's some other things. A person using the ruling gift or the leadership gift demonstrates the capacity to exercise influence over a group as to lead it towards the goal or the purpose with a particular emphasis on the capacity to make decisions and to keep the group operating together and moving forward. They are about the where, not the how. That's what a leader, a leader, a leader is about, that's where we're going. That's, that's what a leader does. Um, so I'm using some props today. Y'all excited? Mm-hmm. All right, so here's my prop for a leader. It's binoculars. What's the point of Binoculars see things far away, right? When you look in the binoculars, you're like, I think something's out there, I th something really cool. And then when you get the binoculars up, I'm seeing myself really big on that screen over there. <laughs> like when, when you get the binoculars up, all of a sudden what was far away becomes in clear vision, right? And you can twist these and you can focus them and you can make it just right. So when you're looking through them, you are seeing miles and miles away that you couldn't see with your naked eye. That is a leader. A leader is the one with the binoculars that says, that's where Jesus is. That's where God is. That's where we're supposed to go. And they see it way before anybody else sees it. And they say, hey guys, there it is. There he is. That's where he wants us to go. Now let's, let's go. Now, the thing is, the leader, if that's all he does, it'll be a mess getting there. Because the leader needs the administrator, right? The leader needs the other gifts. He needs the shepherds with him to help get the people to where they need to go. I think about this with Moses. I feel so bad for Moses. He was put in charge of like a million grumpy people in the middle of a desert, and there was no fast food, right? Like, and they were grumbling at him all the daggum time. It got to the point where he had such a burden on his shoulders, he didn't sleep, he couldn't eat, he, he was in front and set up a tent, and everybody, every day, every minute, was coming into the tent to have him judge whatever the situation was amongst the different people, until finally his father-in-law comes in, Jethro, and says, what you're doing is not good. You're going to kill yourself, Moses. You need to have some people underneath you, and so go find some people who are godly, have integrity, and now put them in charge of hundreds and fifties, and, and he, he breaks this whole kingdom into smaller segments and says, now let them do their part, and you do yours. Your part, Moses, isn't to be in the weeds figuring out the small problems between all the people. Your job is to see where God is and where he's taken us. So do it. That is the role of a leader. That is the spiritual gift of leadership. They're the binoculars. And they see where God's taken us, okay? We need leaders in the church. This is actually a very important role. 
If you don't have this role in a church, you'll have a very small church, and you'll have a very inward-focused church, and, uh, and, and not a church really moving into the deepness of God. This one is powerful and, and so needed. Now, I'm going to continue in giving some warnings, okay, with this, uh, because this, this is one of my top three spiritual gifts, um, and, uh, and I've gotten in trouble with this one. Um, learn from my mistakes, would you? Right? Like, th- I love it when I get to learn from somebody else's mistakes. Um, because my top three are, are teaching, apostleship, and leadership. And with those, um, I can get into trouble because I'm like, there it is. Let's go. And, ah, you know, like that, that's me. And, uh, and people are like, what's happening? The boat's rocking. I don't know what's going on, right? Um, see, this gift, uh, when, it's, when it's not done in a healthy way and it's not done with the right people around you, it, you can take people in, to the right place the wrong way. And you can hurt people in the process unintentionally, even though you know that's where God's taken us. And so we, if you have the gift of leadership, that's why I think the whole calling in Timothy and in Titus of elders and shepherds leading the church is do it with integrity and don't do it alone. There's this plurality of leadership that needs to happen in the life of a church for it to be healthy where all the gifts especially the five listed in Ephesians 4, apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, and teacher, need to be in play in the leadership structure of a church so that we are doing it the godly way and we are using all the gifts as we get there. Now, with this one, um, and leading into kind of this idea of, of the next gift, which is pastor, shepherd, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give some warnings again, okay? Because um, I think so often in the life of churches, the hurts come in people's lives when there's wrong expectations of how people are to operate. And especially when it comes to an expectation on a pastor. There are those who sit and have a title of pastor in the life of the church, but do not have the spiritual giftedness of pastor shepherd. <clears throat> and, uh, and that's where I sit. I have the gifting of leader, apostle, and, um, and <clears throat> excuse me, and, and teaching but I don't have the pastor shepherd thing. And, I, and I've seen people like get so angry at me because I'm not shepherding them in the midst of their problems. Um, we, we have people who have that gift of pastor and shepherd that, that love being with people and they need to use those gifts. And we need the church body to be used. Those. I'll explain what that is in just a minute. But I want to protect our church from having a wrong expectation from anybody in any sort of leadership role by putting something on them that isn't the Spirit's gifting on them, no matter what title they have. This is why, again, the importance of a plurality of leaders in the church, because it takes all of us using our gifts so that we can lead the church in a healthy way. Um, I, I just want to be careful that... I'm trying to be careful how I say it and how I speak. That, that, that in our church, we don't have unrealistic expectations. Because what will end up happening is you'll get hurt and I'll get hurt. I don't know how many years of, of my life figuring out this pastor role, and I grew up as a preacher's kid, trying to understand what I'm supposed to do in that role. Because I, I figure out as you go kind of a thing. <laughs> you know, it's like, okay, God, you put me here. Now I'm just, okay, here we go. I'm trying this thing out, and I'm, okay what works what doesn't work and how how often and how long of my my seat of being a a lead pastor i felt like i was the wrong person and that god messed up with me because i didn't have this pastor shepherd thing over here and that's what everybody wanted from me and i felt like i must be wrong i'm doing something wrong this isn't the right fit for me i don't know what to do um it took a long time for me to realize God didn't make any mistake with me. I see where God wants to take us. I see the next step of where we should be heading. And my role here as a pastor is to lead us there. And we absolutely, totally, 100% need shepherds along that vision to shepherd the flock, all of us in this room, to meet the needs and help us grow and have care. But it's not going to be me. So if you want it to be me, you should go find another church. 
because that church will probably be about a church of 100 to 150 people and a pastor who can only shepherd that many people because that's all the amount that a shepherd can actually lead when they're in the day-to-day relationship with everybody. There's nothing wrong with that. It's interesting, when you look at the scope of the land in the United States, 80% of the churches are 200 or under. Do you know why? Because they're being led by shepherds who are in the weeds, and that's not a bad terminology, but they're in the weeds of the problems of everybody in the church, and they only have a certain capacity until they burn out, and unfortunately, a lot of them do burn out because everybody's expectations upon them, which aren't right, right? Um, So I'm just kind of being blunt and honest, I guess, because I don't want anybody in this room to have an unrealistic expectation. And I also, if you have the gift of shepherding, I need you to understand, you are so needed in the church body. What I'm, what I'm telling you here at New Hope isn't that you're not going to get shepherded. You're going to get shepherded by the people who have the gift of Pastor Shepherd, by the people who have the gift of mercy, by the people who have the gift of helps, by the people who have the gift of exhortation and encouragement. You will get shepherded as the body does its part, as we all do our part. That's what the church is supposed to look like. So, so let's, let's talk then from leader, from a leader um, to a Pastor Shepherd. Moses was a leader. He was out front leading by example. This is very interesting. Jesus was a shepherd. Jesus led 12. And then later on, 150. Interesting number, right? 170. And then he sent them out to start the church to get the thousands. Jesus never led thousands because he gave the example of the shepherd gift. I'm here to really invest in these few and then let them be empowered to do the greater work. Where Moses was like, hey, millions, follow me. Right? Do you see the difference in the gifting? Um, neither of them are wrong. They're both needed in the body of Christ. So let's, let's transition. Everybody with me? Yeah. Pastor Shepherd. So, and, and I needed to talk about this because it's leadership and it's church, right? This gift, and the gift that goes with this is the gift of Pastor Shepherd. So this is Ephesians 4, 11, and 12. This is what we call the five-fold ministry, five roles of leadership in the church. So Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, or in other words, shepherds, and teachers to equip the people for works of service. The pastor role is a part of that process. Um, This can be translated either pastor or shepherd. It's that same imagery. This is what this person looks like. Um, If you are a pastor shepherd, you exercise concern and care for individuals in the church to encourage them in their growth in Jesus, which involves modeling maturity, protecting them from error, and sharing biblical truth. You assume assume long-term responsibility for the spiritual welfare for one group of believers. There's a lot in there. Okay? This is a spiritual shepherd, pastor. They exercise concern and care. Key words here. Care, encouragement, right? They, they model maturity. They, have, they feel a sense of responsibility for individuals. And they want to be sure that individuals are growing, that they're being led to the right place, whatever that is, whatever that next pasture might be for them in their spiritual growth. They want to lead them that direction. Some other words that I can describe this. Shepherds are directly involved in the care and concern for the individual, not the group as a whole. They would sacrifice the group for the sake of one. Where leaders make calls for the all, pastors make calls for the one or the some. Does that make sense? You hear the difference? A leader's like, all of us, we're going. The shepherd's like, okay, guys, us few, this is where we're going. And let me help you get there. They're concerned about what's happening with each individual and each smaller group and taking them on that journey of whatever that greater vision is that the leader says, this is where God's leading us. They're more about the care of the one or the few rather than the all. This group is absolutely necessary in the body of Christ. Um, Some of you in this room act as pastor shepherds. Here at New Hope, we have small groups. And we do that for a reason. Because any time a church gets bigger, it's got to get smaller. Because I, I believe life and growth and spiritual development and discipleship happens not typically here on Sunday mornings in the bigger circle. It happens in smaller circles in homes throughout the week where there's eight or 12 of you and you're doing life together and you're praying for one another and you have a group leader 
who's in your group trying to shepherd you and help you grow and help you take that next step. That's the role of a small group leader is to help you experience care and belonging and prayer and support and, and help lead you into the next step of whatever it might be. Now, here's just some interesting stats as I've studied this. If you're a volunteer and you have this gift of shepherding, you can probably shepherd a group of 8 to 15 families. And that's awesome because we need that here at the, at the church. Maybe if you're a staff member or you gave your full-time staff attention to just shepherding, you could probably lead between 50 and 100 families. And again, that's why 80% of the churches in America are 200 or less, because they're led by shepherds who are want to be involved in the everyday lives of everybody that they're leading and shepherding. And there's nothing wrong with that. I need you to hear that very loud and clear. There's nothing wrong with a church of 200 or less. They're needed, because if they weren't there, there would be hundreds of thousands of millions of people not in churches. There would be hundreds of thousands of millions of people not being shepherded by anybody. Like, all of it's needed. All of it's needed. So here's my illustration for this. Um, because we're talking about shepherding, it's the shepherd's hook. Now, this is a really cheap, flimsy plastic one that comes apart. All right, so I wouldn't, <laughs> if, if the sheep tried to get away, it'd be like, boom, and then it would run off with the, all right, so found this in the closet. It's the best one I got, all right? Because like a shepherd, the reason they have these, there's a purpose for it. It's not just to look like, okay, oh, there's the shepherd because he's got one of these. It's like his calling card. Um, they have it because they use it for multiple things, right? It's got this hook on it because when, it, when they see a sheep that's out and starting to go on its own, they wring it by the neck in the most nice way, and they, and, they, and they bring it back into the herd. Like, hey, come back over here with the group. And so this is a protective thing, right? This is like, don't go over there. That's a dangerous place. Come back. All right, now you're with us again. Woo. I'm glad you're with us again, right? They're looking for the lost. They're looking for the ones that are out wandering around and to be sure they come back into the fold. The other end of the stick, do you know what it's used for? A couple of things. One, it's to prod when they're not moving where they should be. Hey, come on, right? Like, keep moving forward, right? It's to prod them on, but it's also to protect. When the wolf comes or the lion comes, they got something to beat that thing down with and to scare it off. There's a lot of things that happen with one staff. And that's the same way with sheep in the church. That's what a shepherd does. He, he or she, I'm, and I'm going to say that, it's, it doesn't, this is not a gender-based, and none of these gifts are gender-based, by the way. God and the Holy Spirit chooses whoever, whenever, however he wants to use them. And, and so they look at the group, and they love the group, and they will use whatever they can to protect them, to pull them back in, and to lead them to that next thing that God wants for their life. We need shepherds. Actually, we need one shepherd for every 10 people in this church. Because if you want to be shepherded, that's how it's going to happen. That's where you're going to find care. That's where you're going to find belonging. That's where you're going to find acceptance and understanding in the life of the church. So as we get bigger, we've got to grow smaller. If you have the gift of shepherding, please, please, please use it here. We need it. We need you to help us continue to care for people. The shepherd's hook. That is the gift of shepherding. And so I think you guys hear the difference between a leader and a shepherd and why both are needed and that God gifts them very differently, but it's all to the same God focus of what he wants to do in the body of Christ. All right, last one. Okay. Everybody doing good? Last one is the spiritual gift of evangelism. Okay. This is, these are word gifts. These happen with words. Okay. Okay. Teaching, leading, shepherding happen with words. Evangelism. This is, again, in that Ephesians 4. So Christ gave himself the apostles, the prophets, and the evangelists. The evangelists are out there. And the evangelist, um, in this passage, let me take a drink real quick. The evangelists are the one that have their, their, uh, their sneakers on. They're the ones that are ready to go wherever they need to go. They're the ones that have this passion inside of them because they want to tell somebody about Jesus all the time. And they can't wait to do that. They look for opportunities around every corner, whether it's at work or at school or at home or uh, on the street or on a trip or on an airplane. Wherever it is, they want to tell somebody about their Jesus. And they can't, they can't get around doing it. Like, they just want to do it. Here's, here's a way to describe somebody who has this gift of evangelism is that you have the special ability and passion when communicating the gospel to compel unbelievers to repentance and salvation. 
Like there's just something in you. You have to do it. You desire it. And when you do it, people get saved, right? You challenge people with words to receive the gospel of Jesus Christ and to take their first steps into discipleship. You have a passion for those who are lost. And you can't wait just to tell them what Jesus did and what he did for you and what he wants to do for them. I mean, this person has this, this, this desire and they can't get rid of it. This one I've used as an example of, of the people that they, they see others who don't have the same passion. And they're like, why can't you tell people about Jesus? Why are you as excited as I am? You know, like, like the, a lot of times those who have this gift, they're confused by why other people don't have the same passion. And um, it's because they just want to do it. They just want to do it. Now, there's some famous evangelists, right? I don't know if you've ever heard of Billy Graham. Have you ever heard of Billy Graham? Yeah. Holy cow, the guy... I, I, I don't know if there's ever been an evangelist like Billy Graham that's walked on this planet. How many millions of people have a relationship with Jesus today because of that one man? Wow. Now here's the problem. If you have the gift of evangelism, who do you compare yourself to? Hopefully not Billy Graham, right? Because you're like, I'm no Billy Graham, <laughs> but, but I want to tell somebody about you. Maybe, I don't know. <clears throat> this is where the comparison gap can come into play because we see other people with the gift of evangelism and their rivers are just wide and flowing and you're like, when they say it, man, hundreds, thousands, millions of people come to know Jesus, oh my goodness. We cannot compare their gift to your gift. If you have the gift of evangelism, you know where you're supposed to use yours? Right here, right now, wherever it is, to whoever's lost, right? And that could be one-on-one. -on -one. It could be in front of a group of people. It, it, Whatever God wants you to do to use that gift to share the gospel, do it and see what he does. This person typically, when they're praying, a majority of their prayers are for people who don't know Jesus yet. They just have to pray for them. They're like, God, I just pray that they'll come to know you. God, I pray that they'll understand what you've done for them. And so if you do that, if you're praying for lost people all the time, this might be a gift that you have. Um, if, if, <clears throat> if you feel this calling to to be sent somewhere. And, and we talked about apostleship, which is like missionaries, but you don't have a specific people group that you feel like God's called you to, but you need to share the gospel. You might have the gift of evangelism. You might have this gift. Now, for the majority of us in this room, this isn't our gift, but we have to use this as a discipline, right? I've talked about where we don't have giftedness, we have to use discipline. Here's a good, good kind of word picture of this. Um, I, heard, I heard another preacher talking about this gift, and he was talking about snow and snow plowing and shoveling out his driveway. Um, I'm so glad we're out of that season. Hallelujah. Can I get an amen? All right. For that one, you'll get an amen. All right. All right. So, like, <clears throat> I'm so grateful. So, like, our driveway is a pretty long driveway. We live out in the country, and uh, there have been many times where we've had to shovel the entire driveway. And by the end, things are hurting that haven't hurt before. Amen? Right? Like, I'm like, oh my gosh, this just takes so much effort. And then you look down, and you're like, there's still that much more to go. And you keep throwing the snow and throwing the snow. It's like, my goodness. See, that's, that's kind of like for some of us, like, the spirit, it, if we have the discipline of evangelism that we know we're supposed to share the gospel, for some of us in this room, it feels like hard work. It's like, oh man, I gotta do this. I know I have to. I know God calls me to. I'm a Christ where I want to share the hope that God has given me. But, but I'm so grateful because I have a neighbor who bought a four-wheeler and has a plow on the front, and he used the excuse of helping his neighbors to buy the four-wheeler. <laughs> Whatever you want to do, brother. Like, <laughs> and so our neighbor, two doors down, every time it snows, shows up with his four-wheeler. Now let me ask you a question. How long it took me to shovel that driveway by myself? Oh my gosh. And he can come and get it done in five minutes and have fun. <laughs> the difference between a discipline and a gift. Does that picture make sense? That was the best illustration I've ever heard, like the difference between a discipline and a gift. Some of you are just like, I'm on the four-wheeler. woo -hoo! Jesus, 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 right? And you're just telling people you're excited about it. Another of us are like, Jesus, let me tell you about Jesus, right? And it's like, it's a discipline. It's hard work, but we know we have to do it. And this goes with all these gifts, okay? Some of us, it's a discipline, and we're supposed to do it. Some of us, it's a gift. We enjoy it, and we have fun, and it's just like, wow. So we are all called to share the gospel. We are all called 
there's a quote, and, and this is a quote by Francis of Assisi, and it's used, and I would say misused more often than not. It says, preach the gospel, and if necessary, use words. You ever heard that quote? Um, it's a good quote, and I think the heartbeat behind it is like, like, you're supposed to live an example of what it looks like to be a Christ follower, right? Like, people should look at you and say, oh, if, if that's what it looks like, I want to be that. But I think there's a lot of people that use it as an excuse, meaning, well, I'm just going to live it out. I don't really have to say anything about Jesus. They just have to watch me. And unfortunately, presenting the gospel only happens with words. You can't share the gospel without words. The gospel is good news. How do you get good news out? You say it. You say it. And so that's the challenge. This is what it says in Romans chapter 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. That's an awesome promise. Amen? Everybody, that's the open invitation that God has. If you call on my name and you ask for salvation, I'm here. The door is open. My hands are out. The choice is yours. He's already done his part. It's your part to receive that gift, right? He says, how then can they call on the one they have not believed in? And how can they believe in the one on whom they have not heard? And how can they hear without someone preaching to them? Do you hear it? It's got to be words. They can't receive the message of the gospel without somebody speaking it to them and sharing it verbally. This is why this is a word gift. And how can anyone preach unless they are sent as it is written? How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. Good news means good words of the gospel. This is what God has done. God sent Jesus Christ, His one and only Son, to this world, to this broken, sinful world, to become man. He went from glory to unglory, to a body. He walked, He lived, He showed us how to walk and live in a relationship with the Heavenly Father, and then He died on the cross. He paid the penalty for your sin, my sin. He paid for it. Should have been you and me on that cross, paying our own price. He said, No. I'm paying it for you in full. He died. He breathed his last breath and they buried his body. Three days later, the grave could not hold our Savior. That stone rolled over and the power of the Holy Spirit, we read, entered in and rose Christ from the dead and he is alive today. Meaning that death on the cross, that forgiveness of sins, just as Christ was risen, can give you new life today. If you choose to confess with your mouth that he is the son of God and confess in your heart and believe in your heart that he has raised from the dead, you will be saved. That is the gospel. That is what God has done for you. And I can't tell you any other way than using words. That's evangelism. Some of you in this room, maybe you haven't accepted that gift yet. God's done it. His hands are open. He's done everything for you. But you, in your free will, have a choice. Do you come to him? Do you confess with your mouth, I'm a sinner? Do you come to him and say, will you forgive me? I believe Jesus is your son, and I believe he's done this for me. And invite him into your life. You will be saved. Oh, that's such a good word today if you need to do that i'm praying that you take that step you jump into the waters of salvation say god i need that if you haven't done that maybe today's your day i don't have the gift of evangelism but i have the gift of words some of you have the gift of evangelism and you need to be telling people that message and you need to be bringing them into the hope of the glory of what god has for them and changing the trajectory for eternity of somebody's life we need you The church needs you, and we need the words of the good news being sent out. These are the megaphones. (laughs) Jesus saves. He can save you. The word magnified into people's hearts in ways that the Holy Spirit works. It magnifies not just volume, but volume in their hearts to come to Jesus. We need some gospel magnifiers. <laughs> some people to proclaim that. Now today, we're ending the gathering just as we have the last number of weeks in praying for those of you who have these gifts. 
and, and commissioning you to use them in this body. And, uh, and this morning, we're going to do that again. If you have any of these gifts, if you, as I'm talking, you're like, I think I have the gift of leadership or, or of a pastor shepherd or of evangelism. And if you have any of the gifts that we've already taught on before, but you weren't here, we want to pray over you as well and commission you. If you have any of those um, love gifts or the word gifts we talked about last week, uh, I want to pray over you and ha- us as a church affirm you in using these gifts in this body. And so during this time, I'm going to ask those of you who have these gifts to, to come forward and to circle up down here. I'm going to ask Tony, our elder, um, to come join me and pray over you as well. Um, so if you feel like you have those gifts, go ahead and come down right now. And, and those of you who took, have taken uh, the growth track and have taken the assessment, I do have a list of names. And so I'll call you out here and you can come up and we'll pray over you. Um, Jenny Cook, Ken Frazier, Chuck Huffman, Christina Moser, Brian Moser, Don Snyder, Danny Deal. Tim and Nikki Broughton, Crystal Chris, Ashley Hirschberger, the gift of leadership. The Pastor Shepherds, Chuck Huffman, Brenda Solon, Stephanie Yaki, James Crawford, Tony Young, Danny Deal, James Crawford, um, Diana Pendell. In evangelism, Jeremy Windham, Charlie Shar, Linda Wardell, Gwen Kaufman, Pat Weber, Carson Papp, Tarina Watts, Liz Young, uh, Nikki Broughton. And if anybody in here, if you, your name wasn't called, but you're like, yeah, I think that's mine. Um, join us. You can come up here and join us if you'd like to. This grouping, as you can see, is a smaller grouping um, because these gifts are very specific and, and are needed in the body. And all of us in this room, when we think about leadership gifts, we need to affirm those in people's lives and we need to uh, encourage them to use those gifts and, uh, and we need to honor them in those gifts. And when I say honor, it's not like some crazy, like, like they sit on some high royal throne, okay? That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm saying is we honor them because of the position that God's allowed them to have in our body. And, um, and so I want all of us now, if you would stand and join us, and uh, I'm going to pray over them. And if you want to join me in that prayer, I always say there's a physical response. You can hold out a hand towards them, and that's just a sign of agreement that you're praying with me and praying with us. Um, as we pray over them to commission them to use these gifts in our church. So let's pray together and you can join us. God, as as spiritual leaders in this church, God, we want all of the gifts used. We want to see these individuals right here, God, using their gifts of leadership, of shepherding, of evangelism in this body. And I pray that you would fill them, and I'm praying this each week, that you'd fill them with a new freshness of the power of your Spirit to be used by you to use this gift here in this church. I pray, God, that if there's anything in them that hurts or has been broken or they've used gifts in the past and have been hurt, that you would heal up those wounds, whatever they might be, that you would push aside insecurities and that you'd help help them, God, to walk into this gift and test the waters in it. I pray for us as a church, God, that these that have the shepherding gift would help us shepherd and shepherd well and that many others would come and rise up and that our church would be cared for and loved and encouraged and prodded as we go the direction you call us to go, Jesus. We confess our love for you, God. Thank you for choosing us and choosing them and gifting them. We just ask these things in Christ's name alone. And everybody said amen. 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 Awesome. Thank you, guys. And we've been saying this the last couple of weeks, and some of you have written, you guys can have a seat.